Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at The Block. Today, joining us on the other side of the mic in person is my guest, Joe Sticko, co-founder of Cryptex. Now, before we dive in, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Huobi, one of the world's leading virtual asset exchanges, has been providing convenient and professional virtual asset management services to more than 50 million users in more than 160 countries for nearly a decade. At Huobi, their mission is to make crypto accessible, to help you understand risks and make informed decisions to protect you and your assets. Learn more today at Huobi.com. This episode is also brought to you by Ledin. From Bitcoin and USDC savings accounts to Bitcoin-backed loans, Ledin's financial services enable you to benefit from your holdings today without selling your Bitcoin. Learn more about Ledin at Ledin.io. Ledin, where your digital assets come to life. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblock.co slash terms dash service. Once again, I would like to welcome our guest, Joe Sticko, co-founder of Cryptex. This is um, technically your third time on the show yes did you realize that yes we had the first one with uh preston and myself and then we had the meeting with you and me and preston and vitalik uh and the mayor of miami and now this is the third time we're getting together so the, thank you so much of course well i mean to an extent maybe i should be thanking you the first episode is a bit of a historic episode Unfortunately, the audio quality wasn't amazing because I was recording in that like hotel basement. Right, right, right. Um, but and that was before we got our amazing audio engineer Stephen. Yes, it was the early days. You were an early adopter of the show. Yes, but that was like the third most listened to episode of the show. That makes us really happy. And I actually told Preston about that um, when we were setting this one up. Mm -hmm. And I said, like, yo, it's it's literally like one of his top performing shows. And he's like, that's so amazing. You know, so that was really, uh, really cool, man. We're very happy to hear that. I wonder if that was the uh, framing. I wonder what the framing was. I think, was that, that was way before the merge. But did we talk, what did we talk about? That was uh, discussing Ethereum 2. Ethereum 2. As well as like when we were first coming up with uh, TCAP. That's right. Yeah. And we kind of like put those two things together. And it was uh, definitely, definitely cool, you know? Yeah. I'm glad a lot of people liked it. And we, we also heard a lot of really positive feedback about that podcast. And then, you know, you saw it pop up in like the, um, like the new section of Coinbase and stuff. So mm -hmm. it was like, it was a really, really cool thing at the time to see that. So it's, it's a bear market now. Times yes. are tough. Yes. We were talking about how it feels almost like in 2018 when there was a degree of hopelessness that swept the market and no one knew what the future would have in store every day or every other day, it seems like a new executive has announced their departure from top crypto firms. Some of these firms are still struggling as a builder. What's it like navigating that environment? How do you kind of stay on the path? Um, I think, I think the most um, important thing is, just keeping your head down and building, right? Like there's going to be cycles no matter what business or no matter what um, like your pursuit is. There's, there's going to be cycles. There's going to be headwinds. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be difficulty. And if you have a conviction and an idea or something that you believe in, the goal is to just continue doing that no matter what headwinds that you face. Um, and just trying to navigate the macro picture to, to the best of your abilities, you know, and sometimes you're going to succeed and sometimes you're going to fail. But ultimately, if you just keep working with your head down and build things that you believe in and build things for people, then you'll survive any cycle and weather any, any storm. Mm -hmm. I feel like you brush shoulders with so many of the top executives in the space. Who do you think has given you 
the best piece of advice who weathered storms and you have leaned on to kind of oh my you get know, through yeah it's just you know for whatever reason i feel like myself and cryptex like it's it's one of those things where everybody at the top or like the upper end you know a lot of we, we're fortunate where we have a lot of friends you know we have a lot of friends and I cannot recall like one single piece of advice. Um, but one thing I, I can say that one of my dear friends, um, Howard, you know, Howard mm -hmm. Linton, uh, he's a founder of stock twits, um, you know, early investor in Robin hood and whatnot. We had a conversation a couple months back and he always just said to me, you know, be there for when the cycle turns, be there for when the cycle turns. And I always like, that was an incredible piece of advice because you realize like what we're facing as an industry and what we're trying to get through. And it's about survival right mm. now. You know, it's just the strong are going to survive and the market has this natural ability to weed out bullshit and cause pain uh, for bullshit and um, survival and being there for the, the next turn. That's, that's definitely like the most, the most important thing. So I think that that was a really interesting, you know, piece of advice but man, there's, there's been so many, you know, like we're so lucky where, you know, you, you had said something to me earlier, you know, at, at lunch, you know, about a quote from your dad and that was incredible advice. Like even just listening to that while I'm sitting there eating, mm -hmm. it was kind of just like, wow, you know, like just, it's, it's, a, it's not about what you choose. It's like the strength that you need to, to get through it. And that was a really cool thing, man. So, you know, thanks to you and thanks to your dad for that one, man. Thanks. Very, very appreciate cool that. Quotes. Yep. Um, so Maybe we can talk a little bit about what Cryptex does for our audience. And you, I mean, so many of us, or many of us, kind of think about how crypto can recreate from first principles things that exist in Wall Street, but also beyond, just in the entire way that we transfer value, represent ourselves online. Um, what part of traditional finance are you? Did you set out to replace, like, in creating a crypto that kind of represents the entire market? Yeah, I, I think I think it was, um, you know, like building indexes. You know, I mm -hmm. think that that was something that always kind of you know in intrigued me. I mean, my my background, you know, was lifelong you know investment manager and, and trader. And, you know, when crypto really came onto the scene, it was kind of like, okay, this is awesome, but like, how do we like build something, you know, where you can track the entirety of, of the market and do it in a, in a trustless and, and fully decentralized way. So there's not a committee of people deciding what should be inside of a, a portfolio, so to speak. It's literally just data. And it's the ability to collateralize data in a trust minimalized way. And once we kind of figured that out, you know, through working with Chainlink, I, I thought to myself, like we have something really special here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what we like, that's like the, the mission of the DAO is to kind of like just take d data metrics that are currently unavailable that people quote every single day, like total market cap or like JPEGs, as I'm sure, you know, we'll, we'll get into with NFTs and take this data and bring it to the world in a fully decentralized and trustless way. And I think that's that's pretty much the mission and, and the goal, man, is to do that. What's it like uh, being a part of or contributing to a DAO? What are the benefits? What are maybe some of the drawbacks in terms of from an operational perspective? Well, I, I think I think from like operations, you know, you have a community of of people, you know, and the community of people you know, they, they want to see, you know, things get built, they want to see things get done. And they're all actively voting, you know, to achieve that, right. And I feel like, you know, for us, we're fortunate enough where, you know, we have a, a solid community of people. A lot of those people have been, you know, contributing uh, through multiple different facets, like since since day one. So we're lucky in the sense that we don't really see a lot of issues or headwinds with, with the community. Um, they understand that, you know, we're not here to pump and dump prices. They understand that we're not here to, 
you know, just 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 spew nonsense. Like we're here to literally build the future of decentralized indexes, and um, they they fully support that. So, I don't think from an operational perspective, it's so much of a community that's necessarily the issue. I think that it's transitioning from like the traditional structures of of a business or of a corporation, and then you know getting into a DAO and working inside of a DAO for the last eighteen months where there was an initial bit of, of getting comfortable with the transition and saying like, okay, things might take a little bit more time or might not work as, as quickly, but ultimately everything we've set out to do so far has been done. And I'm pretty thankful for that. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, we've obviously gone through quite a historic credit crisis and I was watching some of my old hits on <laughs> CNBC just to sort of like see like where my blind spots were in assessing the market, like in my own pontificating, what did I get wrong? Right. I think it's like an important way to like grow and, and learn. And there were, there was one time I went on the show before the Luna depegging and one time where I went on the show afterwards and you could see like there was an added level of, context that I didn't have before because I never had really seen anything like that in, in crypto, a right. massive depegging that wiped out $50 billion in value. Yep. I think with um, experience kind of breeds this level of like crystallized intelligence about a situation. But when, when you saw that, or rather when I um, kind of pondered on, on that event, and talk to folks, people would always say that these like pegs are meant to be depegged. And so like net does that how do you sort of get ahead of that? Did it maybe make you rethink the degree to which like TCAP can maintain its peg and um are there any things that you could do to add robustness? Yeah. What was the impact, I guess, is the question. So so for us, you know, minimal. And obviously one of the reasons why that is is because we were a lot we're a lot smaller, you know, than than Luna. Um the the main difference though in terms of uh system specifications is that for a long time, you know, you, you think about like liquidity, Frank, right? Like and the best scenario I could liken it to is like natural gas. You know, like when there is an excess it just kind of siphons off and just gets burned into the atmosphere. And when you have this monetary policy that's incredibly loose, it's, you know, this is actually what I was just talking about on, on you know, NASDAQ the other day. You have this monetary policy that's incredible, incredibly loose and this money has to go somewhere, right? So where does it go? It goes into the most speculative assets because we know that interest rates are low, the Fed is printing and the, the money just kind of formulates a bubble in, in where it can go. So then you have people who are a little bit more risk adverse that take that knowledge and then employ leverage on it to just generate alpha and, and maximize returns. And one of the things that we've, we saw with that was, you know, the system was, was under collateralized. And when you look at the peg and when you look at these systems where pegs are under collateralized, how do you maintain a peg? It's going to be trading at a discount if there's not enough capital there to value the, the instrument that you're trying to, you know, hold. So for Cryptex, um, it's always been an over collateralized system. Mm -hmm. So while it, it's it's to mint TCAP or to mint JPEGs, it's it's 150% collateral. So we were always getting a lot of questions like, well, why would I post 150% collateral to mint something? It's not efficient. We can mint things other places at 75 or 80%. Well, look at those other places now because we're still chugging along. We had no issues. We had no system breaks. And TCAP, you know, it's it's traded at a slight premium to PEG for quite some time. And it's a problem that the team has been actively working on, on solving through an array of different methods. But um, it's also a market force accounting for that excess collateral, right? And... I'd rather have an over collateralized system of happy people than an under collateralized system that completely blows up, you know? And I think that it might not be as sexy. It might not be as attractive from a, a um, you know, liquidity perspective, but at the same time, what we're saying is there is there. 
and it's backed by users and that's the most important thing that's that's where i think the future is going to be here so talk to us a little bit about jpeg mm. so we set out on this journey um with with chainlink and to to be clear we didn't we didn't build this with chainlink frank like we'll get into how they they built it but Cryptex, I don't think anybody would argue, was um, very impactful. Our team reaching out to Chainlink, having multiple iterations with them of how to create fully trustless NFT oracles that track the NFT market in real time. And nobody had done this. And it was like, you're looking at 2021 NFT market, hottest thing in the world, you know, billions and billions of capital flowing into it, yet there's no way to collateralize it on a trustless basis and, and tokenize it. And we reached out to Chainlink and the response that we had gotten a year ago was way too early, data sources are way too untrustworthy, not something that we're going to be able to do. And we kept on them and kept working and there was about four iterations of um, protocols that were looking to solve this problem, but the data was coming from a uh, untrustworthy source or it wasn't verifiable on chain, which basically just means that it's completely open up to hacks and like anybody could just manipulate the system and drain all the money. And that's not something anybody wants. So over the summer, it got quite interesting because Coinbase Cloud came on board as the data aggregator for Chainlink. And we went to SmartCon and we were all on stage and, you know, we announced JPEGs and they announced these, you know, trustless NFT oracles. So basically now, for the first time ever, you're going to have the ability to track the entire NFT market cap in, in a single token where every collection, you know, Bored Apes, Mutant Apes, um, CryptoPunks, um, you know, all these different collections you'll be able to have a token that represents their value and track the market cap of the NFT sector just like you will, you know, you can for for total crypto market cap. And why I think that's interesting is because these indexes are going to be dynamic where they can be added to over time. So like imagine, you know, you don't have a hundred and however much an ape is, a hundred and ten thousand. Mm-hmm. I, I should probably know this, but Hundred and ten thousand dollars to to purchase an ape. Like imagine being able to take twenty bucks and, and buy a JPEG token and have, you know, accurately track what the performance of apes are. And ultimately be able to post the apes themselves as collateral, have tokens that you can then take to other places and do other things. I mean, like NFTs are, are literally in their infancy. Like I look at them now and it's like where crypto was in two thousand seventeen, you know, and we had that first bus cycle now and now we're in the ground and who knows you know what happens next but jpegs is going to be the ability to track the nft market cap so what's behind it do you have to like how does it how does it track the price because it just the oracles so the way into uh feed into it so the way that it's going to work is think about it like this like you have 10 collections right each collection has a floor price. Mm-hmm. Now, so that, let's say there's let's say there's three maybe for simplicity. So there's right. one that has a ten dollar floor price, another has a five, another one that has a five. So the aggregate right. market's twenty. Right. And the so then the price of the token would be well the price twenty. Of the, I don't know. It would it would be based on the market cap of the floor price. Mm-hmm. So let's call the let's call the aggregate market cap a, a billion dollars. Right. Okay. That the components of that index are going to still be trading in real time based on that floor price. So that floor price is going up and down. So if it's a billion dollars of, of, um, you know, notional, you're going to divide that by a divisor. So to keep it simple, call it a divisor of 10. You have a billion dollars divided by 10. You have a token price that is $10. And then you take that $10 and you collateralize that with an underlying, like with ETH or with, you know, wrap Bitcoin or in the NFT space, you know, maybe Ape or whatever different token has a higher correlation to the underlying NFT assets. You over collateralize that token. And now that token's value is representative on moving as if it was the entire um, NFT market cap. 
Wobi, one of the world's leading virtual asset exchanges, has been providing convenient and professional virtual asset services to more than 50 million users in more than 160 countries for nearly a decade. At Wobi, their mission is to make crypto accessible, building the go-to hub for the next billion crypto users. Wobi believes crypto shouldn't have any barriers to entry. Wobi is committed to asset and platform security to help you understand risks and make informed decisions to protect you and and your assets. Learn more today at Wobi.com. I also want to give a shout out to Ledin. Ledin, Bitcoin back loans and savings by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. As we've seen, not all digital asset lenders are created equal. Ledin prioritizes safeguarding clients' assets with its robust risk management approach. That is why Lenin doesn't actively trade or invest in DeFi yield generation strategies with its clients' assets and only supports Bitcoin and USDC, two of the highest quality and most liquid assets in the industry. Lenin is also dedicated to transparency, which is why they are the first digital asset lending company to complete a proof of reserves attestation. Learn more about Lenin at Lenin.io. Lenin, where your digital assets come to life. How hard was it to sort of get exchange buy-in? Mm. What's that process like, aside from chasing CZ down the street? Well, that was that was uh, Tyler and Cameron. Oh, Tyler yeah, and Cameron yeah, yeah. chase chase them down the street to get on to get on Gemini back in two thousand and nineteen. Well, not to get on Gemini, but to uh, to actually have the discussion and they listened. They were happy to talk about it. So shout out to you know the Winklevoss twins for giving a regular New York City guy a chance to build a business. It was really, really cool. But um, in terms of, um, you know, getting a governance token, so Cryptex, the DAO, has a governance token called CTX, which allows users to vote on things like protocol incentives or protocol upgrades, protocol tooling. Um, getting that on, on Gemini and Coinbase and Huobi and, you know, all over the world, like, that was, um, it was difficult. You know, it was difficult. And with the actual indexes like, you know, TCAP or JPEGs, um, also going to be difficult, especially with the environment that, you know, we're currently in where it's a bear market, a lot of conservativeness going on at the moment. But I think over time, you're going to see the demand for, you know, indexes or indexing of crypto assets. Like you're going to see that pick up and we kind of want to be there for when that does turn because, again... You know, you, you never know what can happen tomorrow, especially in this space. And if, you know, institutions come in, I mean, you know, a couple months ago, you saw BlackRock, you know, now getting involved through Coinbase. I mean, wh what do you think, like, they're not going to want to recreate or they're not going to want instruments that are familiar to what they already know? Like, of course they are, you know? So if you could build something that could be the spy of the crypto world or that could be, you know, the high yield or high growth or whatever, whatever it is you're trying to create index of, of the crypto world. I think that that's going to see a lot of success. Yeah. And that's kind of the game plan, right? To iterate and have many different types of indexes that represent different corners of the market. Absolutely. Um, I was just looking at this chart that we built up on the data dashboard. The number of monthly spot pairs on Binance has declined by a couple hundred since it peaked in May. Right. So it seems like it's a definitely a harder environment to get listed. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely not um, you know an easy environment right now. I mean, I, I'm we're thankful that you know Coinbase and Gemini and you know Huobi these have all been you know incredible in reaching out, communicating. I mean, I'm not even talking about the listing. I'm just talking about having the conversations to how do you do this or they're there to to talk to you. They're there to answer questions and. Each and every one of these outfits has, you know, wonderful people that you can speak to if you want to try to get these things done. In terms of them listing something, you know, I, I, I don't really know a lot about it. I just know that you have to apply or you have to do certain things and then they reach out to you if, if it happens, you know. So I think that it's definitely gotten tougher to your, like you said, I think that's going to continue for a while. But I don't think that that means, you know, you stop building or you stop trying like the, the you know, you just got to keep going. Mm, yeah keep going keep going that's all you can really do at the end of the day <laughs> what else can you do man? when did you um buy your first nft i got my first nft believe it or not kind of late 
I got my first NFT in September of 2021. Mm -hmm. And I had friends that had gotten into the um, Bored Ape ecosystem uh, very early on, you know, four or $5,000 in Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did not pull the trigger on something until, you know, September of, of 2021. So I kind of caught like the, the tail end mm -hmm. of that like initial surge. And then, you know, got rewarded like with some, you know, different different benefits as an NFT holder and like kind of really did did pretty good. But, um, you know, again, ultimately it just becomes something that you're holding for the next cycle. And, you know, just that's pretty much all you could do. Why do you think NFTs are real? Um, again, I feel like that's like saying when you look at crypto in 2017, why do you think crypto is real? You know, like you have a couple of things that have a actual use case at the time. You have a co couple of collections that have established, you know, considerable communities. But I don't think that artwork is the, is the end game here. I don't think that we've even began to discuss. I mean, now we're starting to look at it, but music, Frank, um, you know, gift, gift cards, um, you know, con like there's so many different facets. And the question you ask yourself is, okay, well, if these things already work, then like, why would you recreate them? Mm. Right? Like if it, if it already works, like, why would you recreate them? Well, Sears had a catalog that sold all types of things and you'd get it in the mail. Why did they recreate it? Because the times change. And I think that, you know, generations now, these things are becoming almost second nature to them. So for them to go on a marketplace and be able to interact with their favorite artist or purchase art directly from their favorite artist or go to Starbucks and get a coffee and get a, get a gift certificate NFT uploaded to their wallet. I mean, the possibilities are really endless. And as we know, anytime that there's something with incredible po impo possibilities to it, usually um, an entire market builds around that. And that's usually when like the lows are happening, when new players are getting involved. And then there's always historically a, um, you know, second cycle, like, I don't know what happens to NFTs or art, but I definitely don't think it's done yet. And I definitely think that there's a lot of room for continued development and continued improvement. And we're happy to see it and be a part of it. What do your friends in the music world think about well, NFTs? That, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm happy you asked that because I have a lot of friends um, in the music industry, a lot of very you know cool people, you know people that have written number one records, people that have won Grammys and um people that own recording studios that you know house all this stuff right they're very interested they're very interested i know warner just came out and said that they were getting into uh you know the nft space like they're interested not for the technology i, I really don't think that a company like that they're not in it for the tech they don't give a shit about the technology they care about money and if they know that they have ex artists that now have new ways to employ, you know, revenue potential. They're going to go there, you know, and all but the people that I, I'm friendly with and the people that I know in the industry, they're interested, they're watching, and I think that they're coming up with their own type of plays. And, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be pretty exciting in the next uh, year or two. Yeah. Be a good time to sort of start like a. NFT infrastructure company. Absolutely. Probably. And, and that's that's why, like, you know, I feel like we're just scratching the surfaces now with starting to look at ways to build indexes. I think that, that you know, with what Chainlink and Coinbase are doing together in terms of data, um, I think the possibilities for lending, the possibilities for building out, you know, lending markets or borrowing markets or even shit, rental markets, mm -hmm. you know, where you could rent some of these things i mean you're seeing in some of these communities the ability to now take like you know we're sitting here you know like you have a soft drink like imagine the ability to brand this soft drink right like and make this the nft and like go sell it because that's your nft like imagine like just possibilities are just endless yeah um, there are so many interesting use cases um have you ever have you ever gone to any of these events or concerts in the metaverse i have i have not i i'm surprised <laughs> i i, I have, feel like you'd be there with snoop <laughs> in decentraland 
Yeah, see, or that, no, 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 sandbox. Well, He's, sandbox. I, I've definitely, I've definitely, you know, utilized the the, the applications. I just, I've never went to the conference, uh, the uh, the concerts, or or anything like that yet. No. But you go to real life concerts. Yeah, real life concerts. I enjoy. Any you recent know. ones stand uh, out? Rammstein. Oh, nice. Rammstein was was definitely uh, that was some that was some crazy shit. That mm-hmm. was at um, Meadowlands back in September. It was a great show. Um, they did, they, you know, they always do like a crazy thing, like with theatrics and and different stuff. So that was that was definitely cool, man. But I like all, all types of music, man. You know, everything. I was um I was trying to figure out like this song. It's like a pop song where it's like Gucci, Fendi, something, <laughs> Madonna. I, I have no you know f- what I'm talking about. Um, so I Google it and I look up and I found this like crap or this electronic dance music song that's just like. Um, Balen- um, Balenciaga. What's the one? Balenciaga. Balenciaga. The song is just like Fendi Prada Balenciaga. Pet Fendi Prada Balenciaga, and it's oh, just like shit. it's like house music. Yeah. Um, I can't. I can't say I heard that one, man. You got to send me that. It has like it had no. I was looking for a different song, but I stumbled upon this one, and so I'm blasting it in my basement, and then I I guess I left it on YouTube, and then I came back downstairs, and I had a three hour long like edm oh uh, yeah you want a playlist yeah one of those playlists <laughs> i kept it on i did my whole work i did all my work that day to edm blasting in the background that's not that's not necessarily that's a like, terrible thing EDM's kind of dope i was just doing some uh doing some exploration yeah I, I i probably would i'd play it but i feel like we don't have the copyright yeah i don't think i don't think um, you could do that i think that if you do that then they'll they'll, they'll come after they'll me they'll come after you um, so what are, what's on the horizon for you? What are you most excited about? Um, right now, just just building, you know, building with the team, keeping our heads down. You know, I feel like we're, like we were talking about, you know, earlier. You know, like we're here to to build things, and you, you know, it's it's kind of like crypto in a lot of senses. You know, you get cycles, and you get ego, and you get different things that get involved, and it kind of becomes like the WWF man. Mm-hmm. You know, like it kind of becomes like you you know you're rooting like for your favorite you know crowd cheer or like your favorite villain and like you're literally watching them live out you know their story on the internet like through the technology that they create and that's just like it's it's cool you know what i mean like it's cool to to be entertained but at the end of the day it's going to be decentralization it's going to be development that pushes this industry forward and i'd rather be somebody that keeps my head down doesn't talk, doesn't get involved, just build with my team and just try to build things that make the world, you know, function a little bit better. Mm-hmm. And um, if I can make that contribution, then I've, I've done my job, you know? So I think for me, like what's on the horizon is to just keep doing more of that, less talking, more building. And, um, you know, that's that's pretty much it. Is it hard to find folks, developers in this market? Um, well, we've been fortunate where... Our core team has been together since 2019, mm-hmm. so we have not uh, like nobody's left. Like we we had a couple of marketing people that um, you know left one on one on great terms. We're still you know very close with to this day. One who left on great terms, it just wasn't the right fit. And mm-hmm. now we you know we brought in um, you know somebody. Shout out to to Aspen who has been phenomenal in building uh, community for the team. But it's a it's it's a type of DAO where like. You know, everybody's been here for a while. Everybody really cares about their work. You know, I'm sure you know, you know, through Preston, the stuff that he does, like, it's it's just the like the ecosystem is there and we're fortunate. So it's like, haven't really had an issue with developers or finding new developers, you know, yet. And the ones that we have have just been here for a really long time. So like, we're just really happy about Do you want to share that. the story of how you and Preston met? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could share that. So I was, um... I was dating a girl, you know, for a while. Good girl. And we were together for a while. And her dad, um, you know, he, he happened to be involved in, in like, you know, investigations. He did, like, investigations and whatnot. And uh, one of Preston's best friends um, worked with him on the video aspect of it. So they were doing an investigation one day, you know, um, uptown in the Bronx. And uh, I don't know if it was it was an arson or if it was it was it was some type of like foul ass crime. You know, mm. it wasn't like your typical nonsense. It was kind of foul. And they were in the basement gathering intel on this investigation. And uh, 
like most crypto, they just, they, like most crypto people, they just started talking about crypto because at the time it was just really exciting. So, um, you know, her father had said to Preston's friend, you know, what do you know about this stuff? And Preston's friend had said to him, you know, well, my friend builds Ethereum. Like he's one of the core developers of Ethereum. And he's like, well, you know, him and Joe kind of need to have a conversation. And, you know, it was literally, the DAO was literally created in a dingy ass basement, like in, in the it South It was Bronx. like a phoenix that yeah, came out man. of the fire. It literally just came, came out of nowhere. And then, you know, I had met him, Preston at the time was working at Google and I had met him and, uh, you know, pitched him on the idea. And right away I, I knew I had the guy because he started yelling at me, like literally started yelling at me that, you know, what I couldn't, what I was trying to do was impossible because it wasn't backed by anything. And, it wasn't collateralized and he, you know, he didn't want to hear it and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I learned at the time that that was just like engineers. Mm -hmm. Cause then he called me two weeks later and he said, look, you have a really cool idea, but I have to help you like come up with a, a, a solve. Like it can't just be, you say what the market value is. It has to actually be representative of something. And I have to help you build that. And, um, yeah, to this day, you know, became like one of my best friends, like one of my brothers, you know, just, Wonderful, wonderful person, man. You know, so shout out to Preston. Yeah, great guy. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Integral to the merge. Absolutely. And then the splurge. And, and then, then the, the purge. Purge and whatever else, whatever like else comes after four that. four more. Yeah, but well, that Joe. was a lot of work for him, man. Joe, thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks for having me, Frank. Where can our listeners learn more about what you're doing at uh, Cryptex? Yeah, you can check us out on, on Twitter at Cryptex.finance. The Discord is Cryptex Finance. Um, you could pop in any one of those places and I'm sure somebody will be happy to, to give you more info or, or tell you where to look for it. Perfect. Once again, we've been joined today by my guest, Joe Sticko, co-founder of Cryptex. The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have an awesome day. Looking for more great insights from The Block? Check out The Block Research, the premier platform for research content on crypto markets and the digital asset industry. The Block Research membership includes cutting-edge reports, webinars, company maps, and more, available via our dedicated research portal. Visit theblockresearch.com to find out how to join today or contact a member of our sales team at sales at and let them know that Frank sent you.